Everyone, this is Dr. Marty Ross, and tonight is another conversation with Marty Ross, MD. Um, it looks like we're gonna right now. We've got a kind of a low turnout, but I, I understand the the week before Christmas, and we're getting a little bit late in that week too. So we'll see um, how this goes, and just to whether we're going to have enough people to be able to take questions the whole hour and a half tonight. So if more people show up, I'm sure we'll have enough questions for the whole hour and a half. But we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, so it's good to be here with you again, and um, especially the, here we are in the solstice. <laughs> what, a, what an interesting way to spend the solstice, hanging out, talking about Lyme disease. But uh, you guys got questions, and I, I hope I have some good answers for you to help move things along here. Um, I see a lot of returning names that I recognize, and then I see a lot of new names tonight, too, at least in the people that signed up. And again, I said, well, we're probably up to about 24 people here. So again, it's a lower turnout tonight so far. Um, so for those of you that are returning, I'm, I'm glad to see you keep coming back. I, I think that means you're getting some value out of this. And for those of you that are new here, welcome. Um, there's a couple ways everyone can participate. Uh, so first way is to see uh, the questions that people write. Um, and the reason I say see is if you're in the live version, you actually see them. I'll, I'll put them up on your computer screen. They don't show up in the recorded version, so I will read them out loud as well, too. And then see what responses I give. I, do, I do, try to do a lot of education um, about Lyme disease, about tick-borne illnesses, about mold toxicity when I explain things. So you can pick up some, some tips maybe that will help your, your health in general too. And then the, the other way um, to participate is go bold and uh, write a question to me. Um, and probably the way that with our turnout tonight, you may have a better chance of getting a response tonight than you might on some other nights too. So um, so yeah, I'm here and I'd be glad to answer your questions if you have them. So the way you write a question to me, there's a chat box on the lower right-hand side of the screen. Uh, you can write your question to me there. The only thing I ask is as you write your question, do not hit the enter key until the whole question is complete. In other words, don't use your enter key to try to create separate paragraphs. Just write it as one big long run on paragraph, all right? Every time that you click the uh, enter key, it sends a new question to me basically. So um, it gets really hard for me on my side to track all the various components, all right? And then tonight I um, we are creating a recording and if everything goes as planned, I will uh, edit that up this evening, create a synopsis and get it out to you in the morning. Um, if you were able to sign up for this, and, and most of you did, I had to send out a link to somebody who had a hard time signing up. But if you actually did sign up, you will be on my list of people that attended. And I will send you an email in the morning with the synopsis of what we talked about. Um, it will also include links to sign up for the next uh, webinar. What I want to let you know is right now there is a webinar um, set up for next week on the 28th, but I'm going to cancel that. I'm actually going to be um, traveling uh, this next week. In fact, I leave tomorrow morning uh, and I will be gone. So I'm going to go ahead and, and move that into January. But in uh, the email tomorrow morning, you'll have a link to sign up for the January series of webinars um, when I return. All right. And so without any further ado, let's go ahead and get started here. Let's look and see what the first question is that you have. Let's see here. Hello, Doug. This is Dr. Ross. A few questions. Um, have you heard of HS291, a drug in development that targets and destroys Borrelia burgdorferi, supposedly with few side effects and no antibiotic resistance? Um, do you know if benzos, which I use, make Lyme symptoms worse? One doctor makes the case that they do. And three... I've been on LDN for inflammation for 18 months, ramping up very slowly from 0.5 and just reached 4.5 milligrams. It hasn't helped me very much. I'm also on curcumin. What is the optimal dose of LDN in your view? And if it hasn't helped me, should I just stop using it? Thanks and happy holidays. All right. So um, I haven't heard of HS291. Let me just do a quick, while we're sitting here, I'm just going to do a quick, squish. I wonder if I've heard of it, but this, you're naming it something different. So hold on here a minute. Ah, there it is. Let's, hold on, let me see here. Huh. 
Oh, this is coming out of Dr. Spector's lab. So Dr. Uh, Neil Spector um, has passed away, but he was part of an oncology lab, um, I believe at University or Duke University. And uh, his lab, uh, before he passed away, he had started changing some of the focus of his research to finding novel treatments uh, for um, Lyme. And this is one, um, what I would say is um, it's, it, although this does, I, I did read about this, this um, does look promising, but, um, you know, going from lab experiments to actually getting FDA approval and then finding somebody to manufacture it, we're, we're years away from anything, okay? Um, but th that's an interesting, uh, it, it, it is something that's interesting. So I have, I have read, I just wasn't remembering the HS291. Um, let's see, the second thing is, let's see, do you know if benzos make Lyme symptoms worse? You know, there's starting to be some literature saying that benzodiazepines, which would be things like uh, Ativan, um, diazepam, which is Valium, um, some of your short-acting sleep medicines um, are benzodiazepines as well, too, that they may make Lyme symptoms worse. I would have to say my experience, because I used a number of them in my practice, was I didn't see that happen, but I'm open to looking at that. But there is starting to be some reporting on that. Um, and so I think based on that, you know, at this point, um, I think, as you know, I'm not treating people anymore, but if I was, I would be very cautious um, about using benzodiazepines. There is some literature starting to suggest that it may make Lyme symptoms worse, all right? And then in terms of your question about low-dose uh, naltrexone, so everyone, uh, naltrexone is a narcotic blocker, and it's used for people that are trying to control addictions. Um, and when we use it for those situations, it comes as a 50 milligram pill. Um, there's another way to use naltrexone, and that's when we call it low-dose naltrexone, which is we use smaller amounts of it um, in the uh, uh, dosing all the way up to about 4.5 milligrams. And that's where Doug has recently reached. Now, the reason that we use naltrexone is it regulates endorphins in our body. So narcotic receptors are actually endorphin receptors in our body, all right? Our body makes these group of chemicals called endorphins and they regulate pain in us. They're our natural narcotic system, but they also regulate the immune system as well too, all right? And um, so if you were to, if you do a short-term blockade of these endorphin receptors and using low doses of naltrexone results in a short blockade, like six hours or less, if you go 50 milligrams full strength, you're just permanently blocked. But if you do a, <coughs> excuse me, short-term block, of these endorphin receptors, it super insensitizes them so that when they're when the, the block goes away, they're super sensitive to the endorphins. And in addition, uh, the brain in response to seeing that these endorphin receptors are blocked starts man sends out signals to manufacture more endorphins. So you get more endorphins made, they flood these super sensitized receptors, and you get um, uh, a regulation of how your immune system works tending to balance it out so it's less autoimmune oriented and less inflammatory oriented, okay? So it can be a way of managing autoimmune illnesses as well as managing and potentially lowering cytokine inflammation as well too. The other thing that it does, there's a couple other things that it does, is um, the naltrexone binds to a group of cells in your brain which are called microglia. Microglia are immune cells in the brain. And if they get inflamed, they result in permanent on, or not permanent, they result in a lot of fibromyalgia type pain and neurologic pain. And what the naltrexone does is it binds to a type of receptors on these microglia called toll receptors. And it has the effect of kind of tuning down that pain. So it's been really useful in people with fibromyalgia type pain. Okay, working through a different mechanism than those endorphin receptors that I was telling about earlier. And then finally, there's a third effect um, that low-dose naltrexone has, and that is there's a type of cell in our bodies um, that produces um, histamines, and they're called mast cells. And in some people with chronic infection and chronic mold toxicity, these mast cells get super turned on to start producing all kinds of histamines. And those histamines give you allergic type reactions, skin rashes, a lot of severe sensitivities to things brain fog, cognitive dysfunction, GI symptoms, a whole host of symptoms, all right? 
And the naltrexone binds to a toll receptor on the mast cells, stabilizing them, all right? So it can be useful for stabilizing mast cells. It can be useful for balancing out inflammation in the immune system and kind of turning down some of the um, autoimmune illness effects. And the third thing, it can be useful for fibromyalgia type pain and neurologic pains through its action on these microglia cells uh, within the brain, all right? So those are the big things, all right? Now, it used to be when I first started using naltrexone, I was giving everyone a three-month trial. And if they weren't getting any improvements, I would stop. And that was a three-month trial at full doses um, or the max dose that a person could tolerate. Not everyone can get to 4.5 milligrams. But what I learned subsequently at a conference this must be about five or six years ago, um, that people were having better experience, the uh, experts in using this were expressing better experience if they tried at least six months. It takes a full six months to know if it's going to make a difference for you. So, Doug, I, I would suggest staying on this longer. You haven't used it long enough, okay? All right. Uh, let me do a quick screen share here if people want to read a little bit more about some of the concepts I just talked about. Let's see here. All right. So this is Treat Lyme by Marty Ross, MD. This is my Lyme information site. Um, if you're looking for information, more information about low-dose naltrexone, take a look in my immune system section here and scroll down. Looks like here is my article on low-dose naltrexone, all the things that it can do. Okay. All right. Um, and then in terms of um, mast cell activation syndrome and the role and what it is and the potential role of low-dose naltrexone in addition to other things helping it, take a look at my article here called Mast Cell Activation Syndrome and Lyme. Okay? All right. All right. Doug, thanks for your question. And uh, yeah, I'm interested to see what happens with uh, this work that came out of Neil Spector's lab as well, too. Yeah. Hello, Kate. Let's see how Dr. Ross, thanks for hosting. You're welcome. I have a question regarding stool testing. My fecal elastase has come back low on a few prior tests, 173 on my last one. I have a prior medical history of type 1 diabetes, so I'm wondering if this is why, if I should be worked up for exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. I don't have some of the hallmark signs I've read about online, like floating stools, etc. Two, my secretary IgA has also come back low on a few occasions. Do you think this could be from drinking coffee in an empty stomach every morning? What are your thoughts on taking bovine colostrum or the dairy-free version of it? Um, all right, so first of all, so elastase, everyone, so your pancreas, um, which is uh, an endocrine organ that sits um, beside the liver, um, right uh, on the left side of your body under your gut, but beside where the liver is. Um, connects uh, to a duct that comes out of the liver called the bile duct, and it releases uh, insulin, but it also releases digestive enzymes that um, aid in digesting, you know, food. All right, so elastase is one of those that make um, it makes uh, sucrases to break down sugar. It makes proteases to break down proteins. It just makes a whole host of enzymes. All right. And so one of the things that we do on our stool, uh, comprehensive stool analysis test, where we look at all the various microbes in your gut that we can, that we can measure, and we um, are able, as part of that, to look and see what is happening with pancreatic function. And it, we screen for the ability of the pancreas to make enough enzymes by looking just at the elastase. We don't look at all these other ones, all right? And so generally, we think that there is a degree of pancreatic insufficiency if the elastase is under 200. So you're not 
you know, severely bad, but you, you are low there. And that would suggest that other forms of the pancreatic enzymes are low. Now, as to a cause of that, um, I, if you, if I were, if you showed that, if you came to see me, I would want to see the rest of your stool test results. So if your rest of your stool test results showed that you have a lot of uh, imbalance of healthy bacteria, you don't have enough, and you've got a lot of overgrowth in your intestines of unhealthy bacteria, um, or if you have elevations of something called beta-glucuronidase, which also will become elevated if you have dysbiosis. Dysbiosis is a cause of pancreatic insufficiency. And what happens is um, because of dysbiosis, the pancreas does not receive correct signaling uh, from the intestines to produce the right amount and, and types of enzymes, right? So before uh, necessarily sending you off to um, um, uh, an endocrinologist uh, to, to see if there's any relationship with your diabetes in this, I would even step back further. I would want to know what's going on with your the mix of good bacteria in your gut. Um, and and uh, either I would look and see what are the actual numbers. Do you have un a lot of excess unhealthy bacteria and not enough healthy bacteria? Or is that beta-glucuronidase high? And if either one of those situations is true, I would be spending time working on your microbiome. That's where I would go, okay? And so the way to do that is to, to put um, fiber into your gut, which helps the good bacteria to gain a better foothold, all right? And you can either get fiber in your um, gut by having a whole food diet, rich in beans, legumes, grains, uh, fiber from plants and fruits, all right? And as an example of that, look at something called the whole, um, Google, whole, um, th let's see, whole, whole 30 um, diet. Um, and there's a website you go to, they, they talk you through, they give you examples on how to start eating more of a plant-based diet. Plant-based diets are the best thing for healthy bacteria in your gut. All right. And I know I used to recommend people do a, a ketogenic type diet, a paleo, a paleo type diet that did emphasize a lot of plants. But um, as I'm seeing more and more of the science coming out now, it is just essential to be putting uh, plant based fiber and fiber from beans and legumes in you to support healthy gut function. OK, if you are not able to do that, then another way to get all that healthy fiber in you and is to do a prebiotic. And one of the prebiotics you can look at using um, is Microbiome Labs makes a product called Mega Pre. I don't carry it at my site, but it looks like a good product. So it's M-E-G-A-P-R-E. -E. That has a lot of fiber in it as well too, all right? The other thing I would do if you have an imbalance of good bacteria, either because you have increased alpha glucuronidase or it looks like you've got a lot of, the, the lab is reporting elevations in, in, in bacteria that shouldn't be there and low levels of bacteria that should be functioning well. If you've got that kind of a balance. The other thing I like to do is to use about two months of, um, of biocide. Biocidin is a herbal product that has a variety of herbs in it that can help rebalance and reset the bacteria balance in the intestines. And usually I'll have a person take uh, um, a tea, um, one full dropper three times a day, along with prebiotics. And then finally, uh, you wanna make sure you're on a spore forming probiotic. You can either do that as a mega spore, which is uh, part of this mega pre system, or you could do a core biotic from research nutritionals, but you wanna do at least two pills one time a day on that, okay? So that would be my approach. Um, it may, this may have, this is, may not be an endocrine problem. This may be a microbiome problem, okay? All right, all right. And then let's see here. But after, I mean, you know, talk it over with your physician too. Somebody should look at that lab with you and say, wow, gosh, it looks like we got a lot of uh, imbalance of your healthy bacteria here, okay? All right, and then in terms of the secretory IgA, so secretory IgA is, um, so there's, in terms of antibodies, there, uh, your immune system makes antibodies, right? And three of the big ones that are defend us against diseases are IgM antibodies. They're made by white blood cells, um, and they're the first type of antibody made when your immune system sees a new germ, okay? 
they eventually are supposed to go away and then your your white blood cells start making another type of antibody called IgG antibodies, all right? So that's due to infections, all right? In addition, your white blood cells along the um, mucous membranes of your intestines and even your nasal passages and even your lungs secrete a type of antibody called IgA. And IgA's job is to be there hanging out in your mucus layer of your intestines and your lungs and your nasal passages, ready to grab on any invaders that come in, but they're, they're targeted for certain germs, all right? And some people just don't make enough of them, unfortunately. Um, I haven't seen any relationship to coffee as a cause of that. I, I understand your question there. And I'm not really sure. I haven't seen any science that says colostrum makes a difference if it happens, okay? And in fact, I haven't found a good way to increase those IgAs other than getting your immune system working better overall by getting your tick-borne infections under control, all right? All right. So, Kate, thanks for that question. Good luck to you. Hello, Ariana. Let's see. I have gastric ulcers. Can the alcohol in the BioPure Cryptolapis irritate them? The secrets of the tribe Cryptolapis is alcohol free and has a one to three, er, one to three herb ratio. The BioPure is one to five. Could I herx if I switch to that brand? Is there an alcohol free brand that you recommend? So, you know, I'm not familiar with who is making an alcohol free brand. Okay. Um, you know, you can either, so that with your, when you do your um, tinctures of an herb, you, what we're trying to do is we put, we mix the herb either with alcohol or glycerin. All right. And the um, plant, the active chemicals in the plant get extracted either into the alcohol or extracted into the glycerin. Alcohol tinctures probably are a little bit stronger. Um, there's more active ingredients that get pulled over. Um, and most herbal tinctures that many of us use, the type that uh, Buner and others had recommended is on a one to five. When they make the, the tincture, they put one part plant in to five parts liquid, whether it's the alcohol or glycerin, okay? All right, now you could go a one to three. You might, and the reason you might do that if you're doing glycerin is because again, the glycerin is not performing as great of an extraction as the alcohol. So that'd be one way of overcoming it. But it is true because there it's a stronger tincture because of the one to three, you might have some herxing, okay? Secondly, just to make you aware, cryptolapis is just hard on the gut. It's um, it's not all of the alcohol. It's just, it's a harder herb for some people to tolerate with the gut, all right? So sometimes what I'll do if a person is having difficulty uh, with the alcohol part of it, um, before going to a glycerin, what I might do is have them steam off as much of the alcohol as possible. And um, the way that you can do that is um, boil some water, put an ounce in, you know, boil it, and then pour that boiled water into a glass. And then take the drops that you want to have and actually drop them into that water and let it just sit until the steam stops. Um, that you're going to remove a lot of the alcohol, not all of it, but a lot of the alcohol. And I have found uh, with many of my patients that that is enough to make it more tolerable. Okay. And then finally, if that isn't making it tolerable enough, and for people that are having difficulty um, either with the glycerates or with the alcohol based tinctures, I sometimes will have people take some uh, deglycerated licorice, also known as DGL. And what happens when you chew licorice, the saliva in your mouth mixes with chemicals in the this form of licorice called deglycerated licorice, also known as DGL. And your spit and the DGL form this microscopic gelatinous layer that protects your stomach, protects your food pipe. Okay, so that might be another thing to consider doing too. And that product I like using for that is called Rhizinate. It's a uh, R-H-I-Z-I-N-A-T-E. Um, it's a product by Integrative Therapeutics. I'll, I'll show it to you here in a minute so you can see what it is. You just chew a couple capsules uh, bef before you take your medicines, all right? And that can make a, a big difference. And in my experience, was a way that I would be able to have it so people could tolerate 
um, the cryptolepis. In terms of um, alcohol necessarily hurting an ulcer, it, it can, but also sometimes alcohol is just an irritant to the stomach lining, even if you don't have an ulcer, okay? All right. So there's some idea. Yeah, you could look at doing the glycerate, but if you still want to just keep trying your alcohol base tincture, steam off as much of that alcohol as you can, and then try um, um, a risinate and see if that will make a difference for you. Okay. All right. Let me do a quick screen share here for you. All right. Wait a minute here. Hmm. Bear with me here, guys. I'm having a hard time finding where I am. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, there we are. Okay, got it. Oh, that didn't quite go right. There we are. Voila. Okay, so this is um, my um, uh, supplement store, and anyone can buy from the supplement store. This was the store I used <laughs> for my patients when I was treating them. And, and many of you may realize I stopped clinical practice in May, but I, my store is still quite active. Uh, the majority of people that were using my store even when I was practice were not with my practice. So, um, so you can buy anything here. All right. So if you're looking at the brands that I have found to be very helpful for people working with Lyme, you could take a look here. When I talk about quercetin, we wonder what brand I'm using, just type quercetin in the search bar and you would see. And the other thing is you can buy from me. Um, there's a number of reasons that you might want to consider buying from me is that I offer all my products at the lowest part prices allowed by the manufacturer. I don't offer them any lower because they won't let me. Okay. But to make it more affordable for you, I cover your shipping as long as you have order over $50 and um, I, I pay for any taxes that you have. So those are the ways that I can make it lower cost for you um, by going through this site. Okay. All right. So in terms of this licorice product, it is called Rhizonate. All right. And it come, there's a fructose free variety. And then there is a, um, 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 I would say a, a fructose variety. Okay. All right. So um, you can take a look at the product here. Uh, but um, it's actually fairly affordable for a supplement. And some bottle is about um, $16 here. Okay. All right. All right. Good luck to you. Kristen says, hello, everyone. Hello, Kristen. Hello, Joyce. Let's see. Hi, Dr. Ross. I'm very interested in joining your group. However, I believe I read everything on your site, but I don't see where the time of day when you are live with that group. I work part time, so I want to be sure it's not during my working hours. Thank you and happy holidays. All right. So the um, I think I think it. Uh, well, I'll tell you what it is, and I'll show you where you can see it. So it within so what um, Joyce is talking about. Actually, I'll show you everybody here. Just a minute. Let me do a quick screen share again. All right. So I have established an online support community for people living with Lyme called Lyme United. All right. And if you want to read about Lyme United, you can find it here. And one of the things, so I have a number of ways that I support you through Lyme United, of which one of the things that I'm doing is um, a um, Zoom webinar where I actually meet with you. You can see me. I can see you. You get to uh, ask me questions directly. I respond directly to you and I can do further questions. So it's more involved than our webinars here. And that's this thing called Ask Marty Ross MD Live. And I guess I don't have the time of it there. Huh, sorry, that's a good point. I should put that down. Um, all right, so the Ask Marty Ross MD Live, and I'll show you what the actual site looks like then too. So this is what our... Um, what Lime United looks like, okay? This is um, where you go if you participate. 
And in Lime United, I have a number of areas that I've established. There's a whole user guide that tells you how to use this platform. There's a new member challenge that I have people go through so they learn how to use, uh, use this and introduce themselves to the group. Um, we have an area where people can say hi to us when they first join. There's a forum where members talk with each other, uh, 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 write questions to each other, give each other support. I um, am not directly involved in that area. However, I do look and make sure that the people are not um, discussing um, treatments in a, uh, that are not good. Um, things I want to, I kind of look to make sure that there's not harmful things being discussed basically. And I give an opinion on that if I need to, okay? Um, there's another area, it's called Share Your Wins on Wednesdays, where people, um, every Wednesday, they just write about what's going good and tell us how they got there so that we all can learn from it. And then there is a um, two ways that you can interact with me. One is an area called Office Hours with Marty Ross, MD. And basically, this is a written uh, area where people write questions to me. And uh, during the weekdays between 12 and 1, I respond to as many questions as I can that came in over the last 24 hours, and I give written responses to questions there. Okay, so that's one way to interact with me. The other way to interact with me is this Ask Marty Ross MD Live, which is this Zoom type webinar. And um, this is held Tuesdays, um, 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. So it's between 1 and 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. And I take at least two people each week and discuss their full case. They ask me questions, I question them. And then I also opened it up for any questions for 30 minutes as well too, all right? So if that works out for your schedule, great. They're all recorded. People can watch these sessions after the webinar then too. And then finally, there's a, a whole area that we have called Unities Take Charge. And this is an area where members are hosting events, all right? So right now we've got a support group going here. We also have one of our members is um, completing her yoga training and is leading uh, meditations uh, once a week as well too. So our members are stepping up and, and getting involved and I'm glad to see it because it means everyone's, they're making this group their own. So anyhow. Um, so I am, I am, um, so, Thanks for that question. I hope that answers it. You, I, I need to put that information on my uh, landing page, my information page um, at um, uh, TreatLime, uh, but that's that should give you the information. So everyone, um, I'm looking for members. Um, we need more members. And so the reason I need more members is the more members we have, the bigger the community, the more vital the group is, all right? So um, if anything that I just talked about there um, excited you or interest you, join. And um, to, to get to make it easier for you, the first 30 days are free, so you can check it out. And again, I'm looking for members, so um, I encourage you all to, to join. If you think you're getting a lot from the, this conversations with Marty Ross, MD, um, wait till you join the group. It, it's, there's a lot more going on there than even what I do in these uh, interactions that we have uh, a few times a month, okay? All right, good luck to you, Joyce. Hello, John. Let's see. I've been fighting Lyme and Bartonella for over 10 years, actually longer, but that is when I got positive tests from both and started many rounds of oral and IV antibiotics, herbal and alternative treatments. Current primary symptoms suggest Bartonella, uh, foot sole pain, neuropathy, general pain, insomnia, etc. I thought everything was from a tick bite many years ago until I recently read that the book Toxic and remembered that I lived in a very moldy apartment for a couple of years before all this started. None of my doctors have looked at yeast or mold. I took the BCS test and it was positive, then took the real-time test positive for trichocetine and equivocal for xerolinone, and I scored 246 on your yeast questionnaire. Tried some modified citrus pectin and it helped some until I increased beyond five grams a day. Farvarin sauna two, a single dose of liposomal glutathione and a single activated charcoal capsule made me worse how to work up to tolerate effective binders. Two, would you treat, here it is. Uh, would you treat mold and yeast at the same time and in what order? All right. 
So, um, John, I, I'm sorry you you've definitely been through the ringer here. Um, so one of the so when you have tick-borne illnesses, the one of the big reasons you feel very poor is that your immune system in responding and trying to get rid of those germs, um, your white blood cells manufacture a group of chemicals called cytokines. Okay. And um, cytokines get made in excess in Lyme because the immune system doesn't do a good job or in Bartonella because the immune system doesn't do a good job. And eventually it's these cyt excess cytokines that give you most of the symptoms that you have when you have Lyme disease, okay? And also when you have Bartonella, all right? Now, when you have mold toxicity, the white blood cells see these mold toxins floating around and they respond by making too many cytokines, right? So. The problem with mold toxicity is that it can look a lot like your underlying tick-borne infections. And then John raises another issue here too, which is um, if you have too many yeast in your intestines, it also can trigger cytokine excess. And so sometimes when people aren't getting better with their tick-borne infections, it can be that there is another problem triggering all those cytokines, all right? Or it could be you have active tick-borne infections, you've got cytokines coming from your yeast in your intestines, and you've got cytokines coming from mold. It could add together to the whole soup, all right? Now, you can treat them all at the same time, all right? So it is possible to treat your tick-borne infections while you're using binders and, and detox to get rid of uh, mold toxins while you're treating your yeast, okay? But if people are sensitive, what I will usually try to do is go after the yeast first for about a month. I will um, treat the yeast using uh, antifungal herbs or antifungal prescriptions. I'll, I'll show you where the article is on that. And, um, and this is for people that are really sensitive. And it sounds like you're having sensitivity problems. I would probably step back, just stop the binders and even just stop treating uh, for your tick-borne infections and for a month try to get your gut taken care try to get those yeast under control all right my preferred way because it works about 90 percent of the time in a month is to use the prescriptions nystatin along with fluconazole but if you cannot use those because you can't find a prescriber then an alternative is to use an herbal uh, anti-yeast um, supplement i like using something called capri plus which has caprylic acid um, it's got some garlic in it. It's got some oregano oil in it as well, too. All right. A couple of pills twice a day. It will take about two months, though, and works about 80% of the time. So it doesn't quite have the same success rate as, um, as being on uh, the prescriptions. In addition, you're going to want to be on probiotics as well, too. All right. And while you're doing that to control your cytokines, make sure you're doing curcumin, 500 milligrams three times a day. And you might need to just hold off on the glutathione until you get your yeast under control. Then um, it could be that what got missed all along, and it could be maybe your major issue isn't tick-borne infections, but maybe your major issue really is the mold toxicity that you had, um, is I would start slowly increasing the amount of binders. Uh, and and um, let's see... And, a, and, and you could do that with the, the citrus pectin, all right? And maybe sometimes, <coughs> excuse me, sometimes people find they have a maximum amount they can tolerate. So maybe the maximum amount you can tolerate is five grams a day. That's fine. Do that. You don't have to use massive amounts to get all these toxins out. If you can't tolerate higher amounts, then don't go with a higher amount. Use an amount that you can tolerate, okay? Okay. The glutathione you may add back in after you've gotten yeast uh, under control and after you've got your your pectin worked back up to five grams a day, then I would add microscopic amounts, like dab your finger in the glutathione and add that in and slowly increase the amount of a dab that you're doing, all right? So what happens with glutathione is as it it's a detox agent, it's not going to really detox out the mold toxins, but it's going to move other toxins. And it will, um, as a strong antioxidant, it helps lower the cytokines as well, too. But when you add it in, it helps mobilize toxins to move them out 
and that mobilizing toxins triggers more cytokines to be made too, all right? So just based on what you said here, uh, it looks like you spent a lot of time working on your tick-borne infections. You may just need to pause that for a bit, get your yeast under control, then um, go after your mold toxins, get stable on that. And once you're stable on that, then if you still have activity from your tick-borne infections, add in treatment while you're still bind doing your binders for your mold toxicity. Okay. All right. Um, good luck to you, John. Hello, Mary. I see. Hi, Dr. Ross. My ferritin test came back high at 170 of reference range. Um, so everyone, ferritin is the storage form of iron. And there are some people that have problems um, with storing too much of ferritin in the body, and then it can become toxic to the liver. And that could cause a condition called hemochromatosis. 170 probably is not enough to have have you have that hemochromatosis, but you might want to talk to your primary care doctor to see if they can help evaluate for hemochromatosis. All right. There's some blood further blood testing they can do to help figure that out. Okay. All right. Um, good luck to you, Mary. Hello, Carol. Let's see. Hi, Marty. I'm a patient over three years in Ireland. The main player I'm struggling with is Bartonella. I was off antibiotics for five months after doing 10 pass ozone and Cypress for two months. I went downhill after doing this a few months later, so I went back on rifampin, limacycline, and azithromycin. Uh, fluconazole, 150 milligrams twice a week, also on malarone and cryptolepis for babesia. I recently tested very high in mold ochratoxin and gliotoxin. I'm taking Cellcor carboxy for this, which I'm feeling very hard to tolerate. I'm concerned as my lymphocytes keep going down and we're at 0.72 today. My doctor has switched me to co-trimoxazole for January instead of the limacycline and uh, malarone. Do you think this will help? I'd be very grateful for advice to improve the lymphocytes Many thanks and Merry Christmas, um, Kara. So um, bear with me here. I'm just looking back. So he stopped them. Okay. So when you have um, low white blood cells and even low lymphocytes, um, it can be due to immune suppression from tick-borne infections and even mold toxicity or it can be due to immune suppression from your drugs, all right? So, you know, I can understand why he might have wanted to pull back on the malarone and the limacycline. Both of those could potentially do some immune system suppression. Um, the trimoxazole, which is... Um, oh, the clotrimoxazole, which is also we call Bactrim here in the States, is a sulfa antibiotic. Uh, that has two parts of sulfa and something called trimethoprim in it. Also sometimes can uh, lower white blood cells as well too, but you know he switched you over to one potential lowering from two potential lowering. So it seems like that makes some sense to me. Okay, so you just have to see how that goes. All right. Um, yeah, that, those would be my thoughts to answer your question. I, I I don't think it's a bad idea that he's doing, but he's gonna you're gonna have to see what the outcome is from doing that. Okay, and then finally, I just want to say, so ozone. I I know, <laughs> just oh boy. So I'm just not a believer in ozone. All right, now I will tell you, people do feel better when they get ozone, but as a germ killer, it is not an effective germ killer, and I, I want to explain why I say that. All right. So it is true, if you take um, a test tube full of germs, any kind of germs, and you put ozone into that test tube, you will kill all the germs. And so many clinicians then think, aha, 
that's the thing I need to be giving people. That way I don't have to give them antibiotics. If I just gave them ozone, I would kill all the germs in them. All right. But it's foolish thinking because the problem is they've done further experiments to show that if you take um, that test tube full of germs and you put a very small amount of blood in there first, and then you put the ozone in, there's no killing of the germs at all. All right. None. All right. And the reason you don't get any killing is your blood is full of antioxidant. It neutralizes the oxidizing killing effect of ozone. All right. That's not to say you might not still get some benefit from ozone. And many people feel better on ozone. And the most likely reason for that is, is ozone results in better oxygen delivery, oxygenation of your cell energy factories called mitochondria. And so if they're better oxygenated, they're going to put out more cell energy and you're going to feel better for it, right? But the reason you probably got worse after it is you lost, you didn't, during that time period, you really were not on a germ killer, okay? All right. So um, I can show you an article if you want to look at that a little bit more. Um, um, you're, you'll probably uh, agree with what I'm saying right now, Kara, but I'm going to show everyone an article that they can look at so they can see the science that says this is not a good way to kill germs, okay? So uh, bear with me here. All right. So take a look in my treat line by Marty Ross, MD. And then just to make it easier, look under, I'm just going to type in ozone. All right. And so here's my article reviewing ozone as an alternative treatment. And um, I think it helps about 40% of people feel better, but I don't think it is a useful germ killer. Um, my Lyme data, which is an ongoing uh, data gathering research project uh, by LymeDisease.org, where they um, have enrolled, I think, around 16,000 people now that have Lyme, and they periodically query them with questions. When they looked a few years ago at various alternative treatments and what people reported as benefits, about 39% of people that did um, ozone reported some benefit. 20% said very effective, 19% moderately effective. And that, but keep in mind though, the placebo effect of anything we give you, the just giving you something and saying it's going to help you has a 30 to 40% uh, benefit. All right. So the mind data is no different than a placebo effect. All right. That's what I'm trying to say. So, um, but no, it's just not a good germ killer. And you can see all the science here in this article. Okay. All right. Good luck to you. So Mary, um, Mary has a follow-up question. Um, how do I lower ferritin? So the only way to lower ferritin is to um, take blood out of you, All right? That's the way that it's done, but not at this range. I mean, you're you're barely elevated. And again, I, they should look and see, are, do you have this condition called hemochromatosis? But unless they have some evidence that it's hurting your liver, I, there's no, there, you, the binders don't work for this, okay? The way is to actually remove blood, remove iron that way, okay? All right, good luck to you, Mary. Hello, Colette. Let's see, I have a question about Babesia and sweating, or is it perimenopause? About one or two years ago, I was sweating profusely. I would wake up drenched, like I got out of the bathtub with my clothes on. My mattress turned moldy on the underside with all the sweating. Since then, I've been able to calm the sweating down by having feet out and minimum clothing and sleep in a cold room. The last couple of weeks, things have gotten worse again, and I'm awakened several times during the night sweating and having to adjust clothing. I'm wondering what I can do to help myself. Also, I'm wondering, is it possible that perimenopause has started as I am 49? My menstrual cycle is normal. However, how can I tell the difference? Thank you. All right. So um, if you have Bambesia, you are going to have other symptoms besides sweating. Okay. All right. So it is true. Night sweating 
is a symptom that you can see with Bambesia. But also people with Bambesia will often have frontal headache problems. Um, they will have a, a, a feeling like they can't get enough air from time to time. They may have panic attacks periodically. Um, they may have periods where their heart skips around and races. They may have periods where they just get lightheaded really easily too, all right? So those are all other symptoms to look at to see if you have Babesia. And if you have a number of those so that you can answer the question about whether this is perimenopause or Babesia, get a Babesia test. Um, and the best way to test Babesia is uh, through the lab system called Igenix. They have uh, perfected a technique called an immunoglot. And what makes it better than um, um, all the other labs out there, and I mean that, all the other ways of testing for Babesia, the thing that makes it better is that they're able to screen to see if you have the family of Babesia, of which we think there are 15 to 20 strains. They are the only testing company that's looking to see if you might have all any one of all of the strains that can cause Babesia. It's the best way to test. Um, validation studies by um, Igenix suggest that they have an ability to find it 90% of the time if it's there and that it's 95% accurate when they find it, okay? So although I know it's expensive, I would not waste your money on other ways of testing for Babesia. I would just get the Igenix test done. It's the best way to look to see if you have it, okay? All right. Um, good luck to you, Colette. Oh, the other thing is... Um, if you don't have something, all, all that you're having is the, the sweats, talk to your primary care doctor or your gynecologist about possibly getting on hormone therapy to see if you can help with those sweats at night, okay? Um, but if you, know, if you have a number of the Babesia symptoms, then I would get a test to see is Babesia involved here, okay? All right, good luck to you. Hello, Ben. Hold on here just a minute, everyone. <clears throat> Let's see. Hi, Ben. Let's see. I have a question about Lyme and breastfeeding. Oh, Bren. I'm sorry. I had to double look at that. I wasn't in the right part of my classes when I was looking at it there. Um, Let's see, I was well before getting pregnant after many years of illness from Lyme. I got put on high dose immunosuppressants by the reproductive immunologist during pregnancy due to my, many miscarriages. Now the Lyme and co-infections seem to have all come back again and I have been quite sick during pregnancy. I have been, so, I have been on azithromycin throughout to prevent transmission. I am thinking that I should not be breastfeeding with active Lyme after already having been on azithromycin up to now to stop transmission. And also with wanting to get back on proper treatment straight after birth, but wanted to get your thoughts, please, if possible, is a few days of colostrum while on antibiotics a safe compromise or better not at all. I really don't want to take any risk at all in passing it on. Thanks for your help and advice. All right, so the... Um, it is true. There's science that says that you can find Lyme in breast milk. Okay. There, however, is not science that proves transmission. I, I just want to let you know from a science standpoint. All right. And the reason is that many babies, if they get exposed to it in your breast milk, will not get Lyme is that the acidity of the stomach will destroy it basically. All right. But there are reports of uh, people um, Dr. Jones, who used to manage a lot of um, uh, pediatric Lyme and others, do think that the way that some of the people in their practice got um, Lyme was through breastfeeding. Okay. Now, in terms of breastfeeding, the azithromycin is a way to prevent the spread. In addition, you could also use amoxicillin um, in you after, after the pregnancy. Um, and it can prevent spread to the baby as well too, all right? So either the azithromycin or amoxicillin, given you've been on azithromycin for a while, you might wanna look at amoxicillin. 
Um, the other option is to look at a drug called cefuroxime. Um, the cefuroxime would be 500 milligrams twice a day. The um, amoxicillin would be 500 milligrams three times a day. All right, would be enough. Now, the truth is, though, again, we don't have studies proving transmission. But if you want to take the extra step, being on an antibiotic would likely block any potential of it getting through. And I, I can't guarantee that, okay? I just want to say, but probably would block any potential. And so if you're wanting to get, you know, if you only want to do it for a few days so your baby gets your colostrum, he, your baby should be protected with you on azithromycin, all right? Um, but if you even want to do it longer so you can have that kind of bonding you get with your baby and the beneficial parts of your immune system from breastfeeding that get passed on to the baby can get passed on, then you could do that. I would do that with a number of patients in my practice with either having them on amoxicillin or cefuroxime too. Okay. All right. Um, good luck to you, Bren. It's a difficult decision. I know. Yeah. Hello, Kate. Let's see another question for you. Can a TSH of 3.1 cause elevated testosterone in females? My endocrinologist doesn't think so, but my most recent thyroid test shows these two increases. Thanks a lot. So there is not a relationship between um, thyroid and testosterone that I'm aware of. All right. So uh, the other thing I would let you know that um, your endocrinologist may look at that TSH and think that your thyroid is fine. Many of us that treat chronic illness use a different standard for TSH, which is we consider your thyroid stimulating hormone to be elevated if it's above 2.5. And um, so elevated TSH means your thyroid is screen, your um, brain is screaming at your thyroid with large amounts of TSH telling it to make more thyroid because the brain is interpreting that you don't have enough, all right? And the reason many of us use that 10.5 category is the way that um, when we're determining what is a normal range, um, we look at, we basically take a bunch of people off the street and we look and see where do people fall? And we artificially say that if you're within 95% of the middle, we say you're normal, all right? And therefore, we say that at the end, 2.5% at one end of the bell-shaped curve and 2.5% at the other end of the bell-shaped curve, we artificially say they're abnormal, all right? So one of the things, though, that they tried to do in determining normal range initially was to take people that they didn't think had thyroid illness, um, and they tested all them, and that's how they came up with the range. So most labs still report a normal range of about uh, 0.5 to about 5 is normal, all right? All right. So your endocrinologist would look at that and probably say it's normal, all right? But there's been subsequent studies done where they, in this group of people that were defined as not having thyroid illness, they would then go ahead and do ultrasounds of their thyroid. And they discovered there was a group of people that were normal that actually had swollen thyroid glands, which is the beginning of thyroid illness. And if they removed those people out of the, of the uh, out, out of the data, they then discovered that normal actually was 2.5 or less. Okay, so most of us that treat chronic illnesses are using 2.5. All right. Um, good luck to you. Hello, Susan. Thank you for all the information. You're welcome. It has helped me tremendously. Good. That, that's why I do these things. So good. Glad to hear that. Um, I have Bartonella in line. I have been treating it for almost a year. I'm feeling pretty good, but I have a consistent problem with my nails. They split and peel from the fingertip and eventually separate from the finger. Also, sometimes there are tiny black lines in the nails, almost like a fine tip marker that go on the direction the nail grows. Could this be from Lyme or Bartonella? Um, so I'm not aware of that being from Lyme and Bartonella, but what I have found is um, for problems like this, um, using uh, zinc, um, zinc can be useful at helping your nails become stronger, basically, all right? 
And if you are on, as part of your treatment, have been on binders that you that include charcoal, charcoal removes a lot of vital minerals that your nails and your hair and your skin need. All right. So if you've been on charcoal, that can increase the risk of having low zinc levels leading to the nail splitting as well, too. And a zinc dose you can look at is anywhere from about 20 to 50 milligrams a day. Okay. All right. Um, good luck to you, Susan. Hello, Joyce. Let's see. I'm currently treating Lyme, Bartonella, and yeast, and at the same time, is taking cat's claw, Atobobar, Hutania, Sitakuda, Japanese knotweed, Cryptolepis, and a yeast cleanse all at the same time too much. I have a very sensitive stomach, so I've tried adding the herbs to hot water and taking with a small amount of food, etc., but nothing helps. Can you suggest anything else while not making the treatment ineffective? I have tried taking these herbs in a little water on an empty stomach, but the stomach pain goes through the roof. Thank you. Um, what you might look at doing, so I like the fact that you're trying to steam off your alcohol. I talked about that earlier tonight. You might pull the cryptolapis out. That, that And try it, see if you can tolerate it better without the cryptolepis, because that is a difficult uh, herb to tolerate for the stomach, all right? That would be my recommendation. I would try that first and then see where things go, okay? And in terms of your yeast cleanse, make sure that you whatever you're using doesn't have volatile oils in it. Like uh, a lot of some of the yeast preparations will have oregano, thyme, uh, oils um, or um, clove oil, um, those oils are very irritating as well too. So you would want to find an herbal anti-yeast medication that does not have oregano in it or does not have thyme oil in it, okay? You might look at a product by, um, I think it's Thorn, it's called SF720. Hold on here just a minute. Or maybe it's 7.22. It is, th yeah, Thorn 7, actually they relabeled it finally. So th the product called SF722 is now called Unda, um, Unda Selenic Acid, which was previously in their 720, SF722 product. Now they've just labeled their bottle um, to just say, Unda, I can never say the word right, but it's unda, unda selenic acid. That often can be tolerated um, and is quite effective at um, treating yeast too, okay? All right, uh, good luck to you, Joyce. Hi, Sandra. Thank you, Dr. Marty. I'm looking for guidance. It seems I have been having a lot of burning sensations. I recently had shingles, have Lyme and Babesia. I'm trying to discern what's causing most of the burning. I'm starting minocycline after briefly being on amoxicillin. My doctor also recommended a child's dose of a tovaquone since I'm sensitive. Do you recommend LDN for the burning first or the antibiotics? Also, is there anything to calm down the burning that's more natural? Thank you. All right. So, so burning is a neuropathy sensation. So your nerves are injured and they give you burning sensations. So yes, ultimately you are going to want to kill the germs that are irritating your nerves. All right. I do agree with that. All right. But in the meantime, there are some things you can do to both um, help your nerves heal and also to, um, to help turn down this burning, all right? So one of the, in terms of helping your nerves heal, um, there's a couple of things to look at besides killing the germs, okay? So number one, uh, start glutathione. Um, so glutathione is a very strong antioxidant made in every one of our cells but it helps repair damage from the inside, okay? And if your nerves have been injured, it is potentially possible they've depleted their glutathione supply and they just can't heal themselves, all right? 
to do glutathione, you want to make sure you're taking a product that is well absorbed. And you, to do that, you're going to want to be on a product that's a liposomal glutathione, meaning they're microscopically wrapping it in fat. All right. The product I like best for that is made by Research Nutritionals. It's called Trifortify, and they have an orange and a watermelon product. And the reason I like them best is actually got science. <laughs> they actually gone out and researched their product and proven that it actually does raise uh, uh, levels of glutathione significantly in cells. All right. So I would start at a teaspoon a day of that. Okay. All right. The second thing you want to do is repair the nerve membrane. So your nerve membranes, uh, the outer cell membrane in a nerve, well, actually in any cell, but in your nerves too, is made up of a double layer of fat or a bilipid membrane, okay? And the type of fats are called phospholipid fats. So a way to repair that is to take phospholipids that get absorbed into these membranes, okay? And so the product I like for that is a product made by Research Nutritionals, which is called ATP 360. And it is full of these uh, phospholipid fats. And in addition, it has some micronutrients in it that are designed to help your cell energy factories called your mitochondria work better too, okay? And so um, it's a good way of getting those phospholipid fats and you get better performance of your cell mitochondria, all right? And so that is, um, let's see here. Oops, can't use that. So the um, so it has in it, I'm sorry, I need to give you a different product to use instead of that. So a tovaquone should not be mixed with um, coenzyme Q10. And the ATP 360, in addition to having those phospholipids, has CoQ10 in it, all right? So instead of that, what you want to look at is another phospholipid product also by Research Nutritionals, and it's a product called NT Factor Energy. So the letter N, the letter T, Factor Energy, all right? And it um, is full of phospholipid fats too, but it does not have any coenzyme Q10 in it. So you could take that. And the way to do that product is two pills three times a day for two months, and then back it down to one pill three times a day while also being on the glutathione, okay? All right, so that's gonna help your nerve cells to start repair, okay? Then, to manage the pain, an herbal way that you could try to manage the pain to, to interfere with the nerve transmission of that pain is to take an herb called um, L-theanine, so L-theanine, T-H-E-A-N-I-N-E. Theanine is a component of green tea but um, when it gets absorbed into the body, it gets absorbed into the brain. And up in the brain, it's turned into something called GABA. And our brain has a bunch of receptors called GABA receptors. And if you give more GABA to a GABA receptor, it calms down nervous system agitation and nerve pain. Okay. All right. So if you were to do that, you can, I would start at 100 milligrams three times a day. There is a dose that might start making you feel sleepy, but you can take it all the way up to 400 milligrams three times a day. But I would start 100 milligrams three times a day, see if you get benefit a couple of days. If you're not, then go up to two, three times a day. And if it doesn't make you tired and you're not getting benefit, you go up to three, three times a day, et cetera. Okay, now, if the theanine does not work, then talk to your doctor about a prescription uh, uh, of either uh, anti-seizure medicines or low doses of certain anti-depression medicines. They will help limit this neuropathy pain while you're doing the healing work, um, killing your germs, and also doing some of the repair work with that ATP, I'm sorry, the NT factor and the, uh, the liposomal glutathione. Okay. All right. Let me do a quick screen share here for you. All right, so take a look in my um, brain and nerve section and take a look at this article called Peripheral Neuropathy Evaluation and Repair in Lyme Disease, okay? And in here, I talk, you know, that your doctor should have done some basic blood work, and I talk about that blood work up here. So make sure 
that these various things were checked, okay? And then you wanna remove the thing that's insulting your nerves, which in your case is the infections, okay? And then you wanna do things to repair the nerves, all right? And so I talked about that here. Again, you can't do the CoQ10 because of being on the Etobicoke though, okay? But I taught, I walk you through the various things that you can do down here, all right? Um, yeah, all right. So those are some things to, to think about for you then, all right? Good luck to you, Sandra. Hello, Law. Let's see. What would you recommend for a mast cell activation syndrome person who is bit by a tick at the beginning of November? I'm getting burning in arms, legs, feet, and chest. After the tick bite, I had become hyper allergen, allergic to chemicals, fragrances, et cetera. My temperature fluctuates between 95.7 and 99. My hands always used to be hot. Now they are cold. My eyes always now and sometimes bother me. My lungs started to be hyper allergenic and seemed to be triggered by dust and other chemicals. I tried to take doxycycline on November 12th but seemed to be very allergic to it. My neck turned red and got distorted. I want to do the right thing, but I'm very afraid because of my mast cell activation syndrome. What would you recommend? All right, so uh, before I talk about the antibiotics, I would do some basic steps to try to get that mast cell activation syndrome under control, all right? And, um, and so there's a number of things you can do. So one thing you want to do is you definitely, so things that cause your mast cells to get active can be infection. Okay. And we'll talk about what to do about that here in a minute. Stress. Your biggest activator of your mast cells is stress. So I am sure being sick, you feel stressed, but if there's other things that are leading to stress, try to find a way to manage those things. And if you happen to know what it is that you do to de-stress that works, do those things, okay? So if it's meditation, if it's listening to jazz, if it is um, going for a brief walk, whatever it is that you know is useful in helping you manage stress, don't forget to manage the stress, okay? It's huge. It can make a huge difference, all right? All right. Number two, you want to be on um, herbs that will stabilize your mast cells. And one of the best mast cell stabilizers is an herb called quercetin. And it's a 250 milligram pill. I would do 500 milligrams three times a day. All right. Secondly, I would try to block the histamines after they get released from your mast cells. And that means using uh, antihistamines, okay? So you could use Zyrtec, 10 milligrams, one time a day. And in addition, you might wanna use some stomach acid blockers. They're called H2 blockers. Um, Tagamet is an example of one. I'll, I'll, I'll show you the article you can look at here in a minute, okay? So you wanna do that. You wanna avoid foods that are high in histamines, okay? So those are some basic steps, and I'll show you the article that you can look at about that. Okay, and then, yeah, you gotta you gotta kill your germs. The trouble is, um, I you had quite a mast cell reaction to the doxycycline. You know, in this type of a situation, you might want to look at um, trying uh, a different family of antibiotics. And the one you might look at is uh, an antibiotic called clarithromycin, also known as biaxin. And you might tolerate that better, but instead of starting at 500 milligrams twice a day, you might wanna begin at 250 milligrams twice a day, okay? All right. But make sure you're doing things to control those mast cells too. All right, so let me show you my article on that. So you just type the word MAST up here. So mast cell activation syndrome, all right? And the basic steps again are um, 
decrease stress. Okay, that's what I was just talking about. Remove the things that you know you're allergic to. Treat the infections. Uh, remove toxins if they're under this. Lower your cytokines. I forgot to mention that, but the quercetin I mentioned will also lower your cytokines. So you can do curcumin, but I prefer to use that quercetin. Use antihistamines that are H1 receptor blockers. Zyrtec is the one I prefer here. And then do an antihistamines that are called H2 receptor blockers. And those would be things like Tagamet, Zantec, Prelasec, or Pepsin. Okay, those are ones that you could use, all right? And then here's your mast cell stabilizers. I mentioned the quercetin, okay? Um, and then consider doing a low histamine diet, okay? All right. Uh, good luck to you, Log. It's a tough situation you're in there. I wish you well. Hi, Dave. Let's say hi, Dr. Ross. Can you have numerous elevated mold mycotoxins uh, received a real-time labs report yesterday and have no symptoms? If no symptoms, do you still treat with binders? Also, do you treat mold or yeast first? Um, so you can treat mold and yeast at the same time, just so you know. And you raise an interesting question, right? So um, there could be two things going on here. So number one, we have to always be aware that testing can be wrong, all right? And if you have no symptoms of an illness and a test comes back positive, that raises the possibility that it's a false positive test. So it's possible it's a false positive test, okay? All right. Or your body has adapted. Your immune system is dealing with these mold toxins and is somehow handling them uh, and you're not reacting to it, all right? I you're going to find different opinions from different doctors on this. Okay. But the way I have approached this before, if somebody truly has no symptoms is I don't do anything for it because I'm questioning whether the test is valid. And I also don't want to disturb if, if it is real and your body has developed a balance with these toxins, I don't want to do anything to destroy that. All right. Now that's my opinion. Um, I am sure you could find doctors that would say, go ahead and remove them. Okay. All right. Um, good luck to you, Dave. Hello, Susie. Hi, Dr. Ross. Many thanks. You're welcome. Let's see. I've seen a lot of research about congenital Lyme, but usually only relates to in vitro. Is there any research that Borrelia can be transmitted congenitally, but remain dormant until later in life? My early life was spent in tick endemic ground zero, 30 plus tick bites, memorable bullseye rashes, sicknesses untreated, not struggling with Lyme dementia. I'm concerned about my 30-year-old offspring who seems to be exhibiting symptoms that seem to me to be neurological. Is there any way to test for this? Can I genetics detect congenital infections like syphilis? Um, so the only thing you could do, so it is possible. You know, we see that um, we have limited data. I will tell you that to begin with, but the data suggests uh, based on a disease registry not even disease, that's a misname. I'm sorry, I, I, I identified that wrong. A pregnancy registry, not a disease registry, but a pregnancy registry that was kept in the late 80s, early 90s out of Connecticut, I believe, where women that had um, uh, Lyme allowed information to be collected about them and the outcome of their babies with pregnancy, all right? And so what was observed in that data bank. Now it was not designed as a research product, so there were not controls, it wasn't blinded, but just looking at the rough data that was collected, it looked like Lyme could be transmitted 50% of the time during pregnancy if a, um, a woman was not on antibiotics. 
if she was on antibiotics during pregnancy, the transmission rate goes down to zero, okay? Now, so there is a 50% risk that your daughter could have picked it up. And it is possible that your daughter's immune system dealt with it. It kept it under control. But as time has gone on, your daughter's immune system may not be keeping it under control. So the first step to look at this is to get some quality Lyme testing to see does she have Lyme. You won't be able to tell whether it, it was Lyme that was transmitted during pregnancy because there's not a test we can do that does that. But at least you'll answer the question, does she have it? Um, and then you would wonder, did it get transmitted at birth and she just, her immune system did great with it for a while, or did she pick it up on her own? Okay. Um, but um, I would get an Igenix um, immunoblot, uh, not a Western blot, but the immunoblot test method. Um, they have the, the reason I like that test better than other testing is that they're looking to see if you have antibodies against eight strains of Lyme germs. And they grow the, they use proteins from the these eight strains of Lyme germs that they grow in bacteria in the lab. And they modify these proteins to remove pieces that um, would create false positive tests. Um, they remove amino acids that would hold antibodies during the testing uh, that are designed, antibodies that were really made against viruses. They remove that so you're not getting a false positive test due to chronic viral infections, okay? And so the test, uh, although it's more expensive than Vibrant, everyone seems to be rushing and getting Vibrant testing these days. It truly is better. Uh, Vibrant is only looking to see if you have antibodies against Borrelia burgdorferi. They're not looking to see if antibodies against the eight strains that can infect people. Okay. All right. So um, you get what you pay for. So I would do the immunoblot test. It's a better way of looking. Okay. All right. Um, good luck to you, Susie. And good luck to your daughter, I should say, too. So in terms of testing, I just got to do a quick screen share here again. Okay, so um, in terms of testing, take a look at my test category here. And I have an article I put out earlier this year called The Best Lab and Test for Borrelia Bartonella Babesia. And I explained why Igenix immunoblots are the best. And I reviewed the problems I have with all of the other labs out there that are doing their stuff. Okay. So take a look at this and you'll see why I'm recommending that is the best way to do it. Okay. Hello, Gene. Let's see. Question having small broken blood vessels in my hands often. Had Lyme for about 10 years. Is there a supplement that can help? Thank you. Number two, normally good digestion. Some recent events of undigested oil fat with BM. Is this liver insufficiency? Um, so no, it's probably pancreas. If, if there's anything that would result in oil not being digested correctly and then, and then coming out in your stool, it would be due to pancreatic insufficiency in the pancreas, not releasing um, the enzymes that it should that digest and help break down oil, okay? Um, a stool test that you could do to look for that to see if that is a problem would be to get a um, Genova Diagnostic Comprehensive Stool Test and um, and they'll within that test they look for something in your stool called elastase levels. I talked about it earlier tonight. Okay, um, so if you miss that, look listen to the recording tomorrow. Okay, and then you know in terms of blood vessels, the um, there is a new newer discovery that is uh, being looked at in the world of diabetes. And but probably has some bearing in people that have uh, especially Bartonella and other tick-borne infections as well too. And that is your blood vessels uh, are not just a hose through which blood flows, all right? There's actually a delicate inner lining of 
blood vessels, which is called the endocalyx or the endothelial glycocalyx, I should say. And that lining, that glycocalyx has a function and that it has kind of like hair fibers that stick up into your blood vessels and it detects motion of your blood. Things flowing by it triggers these hair cells and that then results in the production of nitric oxide and nitric oxide causes your blood vessels to dilate and be healthy, okay? Now, so you could get it so that you're not getting adequate nitric oxide, so you're not having good blood flow, all right? Number two, that if the glycocalyx gets injured, it results in um, leakage of your blood vessels and unstable blood vessels as well too, all right? So the problem is, as I've been looking at this concept, um, while there's good science in the world of diabetes about this, we don't have any science that I've been able to find in my use, searching through literature that looks at, that says people are looking at what happens to the endocalyx or the glycocalyx, the endothelial glycocalyx when you have Lyman Bartonella. But I suspect there's probably some injury to it. So one thing you could try that um, uh, has some ability to rebuild that glycocalyx and help it work better is a um, seaweed, a type of green seaweed. And there's an extract from this green seaweed that is called ramen um, sulfate. And the product that you can find that in, I, I don't carry it at my supplement store, but I, I am gonna be carrying it at my supplement store based on the work, is a product is called Arterosil, and that's A-R-T-E-R-O-S-I-L. And you might try to use it for a few months and see if it makes a difference, okay? And that's two capsules two times a day uh, for about 30 days, and then one capsule two times a day for about two more months then, okay? Give it a try. See, I, again, I, it's a newer concept. I don't think it's been adequately looked at, or I don't even think it's been looked at in the world of tick-borne infections and Bartonella especially, but there's probably some injury that's been happening to that as a result of these infections, okay? All right. Um, good luck to you, Gene. All right. Anyhow, that's it for me tonight, everyone. Um, so I'm, I'm hopping in the van, er, my camper van early tomorrow morning and heading up to Colorado Springs in about a 14 hour drive. <laughs> so I need to uh, wrap up some business around here before I can go in the morning and uh, including getting the, uh, the this recording edited and get a summary written then too. So uh, it's been good being with you here again. Again, I'm, I'm not going to be doing a webinar next week. Um, we will be doing those again in January. And tomorrow morning, uh, when you get the uh, email from me, it will have a sign up link for the January series. OK, um, and when you get that email, I'm um, share it with other people. All right. Uh, realize if you're getting benefit, they're going to get benefit as well, too. And then again, I invite all of you, all of you, if you're coming to these webinars, you're getting some benefit. That's why you keep coming here you're gonna get even more benefit if you join the Lime United community. So I, I explained Lime United to everyone earlier tonight, but take a look at Lime United. Uh, look at the Lime United page at Treat Lime by Marty Ross MD and see if it's right for you. And if it is, I encourage you to sign up. Uh, we're looking for new members and you guys would be the perfect members for that. All right, All right. Good night everyone. Season's greetings too and, and happy solstice here. Bye-bye.